Hi, my name is Tammy Benzinger, and I'm a neuroradiologist from Washington University in St. Louis. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today about imaging in large-scale multi-site studies. These are my disclosures. I have research support from a number of entities, including the NIH, the Alzheimer's Association, as well as multiple pharmacological partners in these multi-site studies. Um, in addition, um, because this is a research talk, we do have non-FDA approved and off-label uh, discussions. So our goals and objectives today are participants will be able to discuss signal acquisition, sensitivity, spatial resolution, temporal resolution, timing, understand the physical factors such as motion, partial volume correction, other confounding factors, practicalities such as scan time and accessibility, ligand development needs, um, implications of record keeping and compliance, and to really be aware of, of pitfalls in the process. So I um, hope that at the end of this, you'll be in a better position to uh, not get burned as you try to launch these complicated studies and hopefully be feeling very confident in designing a trial for success. So some of the things that I think are important to understand when you're designing a large scale multi-site study actually are the very fundamentals of what type of study we're talking about. So for today's talk, we're going to be focusing on NIH sponsored studies. Um, these are gonna be a little bit different than those that are investigator initiated and might be funded by a foundation or by an industry or um, an industry initiated study that you might be part of designing or you might be a site as part of. So I'll try to, when possible, highlight what differences there are in terms of that study design. Um, the other thing that's really important to understand is um, some studies are what we call observational. So um, you might be trying to image a disease process, for example, or understand um, underlying pathology or physiology or neuroscience. That would be an observational study. But imaging also plays a critical role in um, a number of disease modifying studies for the brain. So, so many um, neurodegenerative diseases, for example, which we previously hadn't really understood very well have been transformed by the use of imaging. Um, and so incorporation of imaging biomarkers into those studies becomes very important. I think it's important in your large scale study to understand the implications of running it only in the US versus the things that come into play if you're considering a multinational study or if you're starting small and planning to expand it into other countries in the future. And then finally, it's very important to think carefully about what type of sponsorship your study has. So um, is it an NIH sponsored study? Do you have additional support from the foundation for the NIH, other foundations, industry, um, other countries, for example, if you're in a multinational type of imaging study? And all of this can influence the design of that multi-site study. And I'm gonna be giving you some examples of my experiences in the dominantly inherited Alzheimer network, which we launched around 2010. And it's affiliated uh, clinical trials unit, which was added on as a parallel study later on, um, both of which are funded primarily through the NIH, but have a number of collaborating funding sources. So beginning with the, the study design, um, and to understand the example, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on autosomal dominant Alzheimer disease. So this is related to three different genes, all of which results in abnormally high levels of beta amyloid. The mutations are in the amyloid precursor protein, presenilin-1 and presenilin-2. And families with these mutations have a very predictable course of the disease and outcome. And it gives us a very powerful model for Alzheimer's disease. Um, families develop this disease at about the same age as their parents. So if my mother developed dementia at age 55 and I'm age 50, then I would be estimated to be 
five years away from the onset of my dementia if I carry the disease. And because it's autosomal dominant, if I've inherited that gene, I will unfortunately develop that disease. So this is our current network um, with our current sites shown in red. And you can see we have sites um, across the United States and Canada, South America. We're expanding into Mexico, Central America, South America. We've had a number of sites um, in Europe, in Japan, in Australia, and adding on more sites in Europe and in Asia. And one of the key things when you're doing a multi-site study is to identify not only your initial sites, which might only be one or maybe five, but to think ahead, um, where would you like to see this going and what might those sites be? And you wanna engage those collaborators very early on because you're going to need to know what scanners are available, what tracers are available, what kind of cyclotron production do they have. Um, and you want to know this um, because it's going to greatly influence the design of your actual study. So what do I mean by that? So signal acquisition. So when you're doing a single site study, um, you may focus a lot on issues like sensitivity, spatial resolution, temporal resolution. You're trying to get um, the highest quality exam that you possibly can. Um, but when you're designing a multi-site study, you need to look a little bit beyond that um, and also think about what's going to be feasible. So what is what are the capabilities of the scanners at the proposed sites? Um, and what upgrades are planned and to which platforms? And you really want to think ahead over the course of the next five to 10 years in order to understand um, how to design a study that's going to be robust um, for not only cross-sectional data, but ideally for longitudinal data as well. What time windows will be acquired? So we talk about this a lot with our pet studies. You know, should we do a full dynamic scan for two hours? Should we do just the last 30 minutes? And there are lots of scientific considerations in terms of the signal decay and the binding potentials. Um, but you also have to know, um, practically speaking, how do these sites book their scans? So um, if, if they only book by a 30 minute slot or a 60 minute slot, um, will they let you um, do a 120 minute dynamic scan, for example? Um, how are they going to, to charge it? So is it is it by the exam or is it by the minute? Um, and if you do one of these copy break protocols, so let's say you want to get dynamic images early on and then later get a set of dynamic images, but let the participant walk around for 30 minutes in between, do you get charged for the whole time? That's really important because uh, that impacts your budget and it's going to impact the science you can achieve. And you definitely need to be thinking about this as you're designing that protocol up front. Um, if you're doing a really large scale study, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to engage expert partners and subcontracts. So for Diane and for the Diane TU, we employ a number of different pet imaging studies as well as MRI techniques. And so we've engaged uh, subcontracts for MRI at the Mayo Clinic. This includes assisting us with protocol design and rollout of the protocols to the sites, as well as ongoing um, QC of the incoming data. Similarly, uh, for PET, we have a subcontract with Bob Kepi at the University of Michigan, who helps us with looking at the um, design of the PET protocols, installation on the scanners, and the longitudinal QC that's going on. We have a number of pet tracers and these also require um, assistance. So we work very closely with Certus Inter International for our Pittsburgh Compound B or Amboid pet imaging. We work with Life Molecular Imaging for their Tau pet tracer, PI2620. We work with Servu for their uh, Tau pet tracer, MK6240. Um, and we worked with Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals and Eli Lilly for their Tau pet tracer, which is AV1451. Um, we also have a partner in radiologics that helps us with the central data archive that gives us a place where sites can upload their scans and where these subcontracts can access the images and put in their QC reports. 
physical factors during imaging, you need to be thinking ahead about things like patient motion, their tolerance for the protocol, how long can they be in the scanner? So we're studying dementia. Um, it may be the most beautiful images in the world if we could get it for three hours, but if no one can stay for more than 20 minutes, it's not going to be worth it. Um, how are you going to handle partial volume effects? How are you going to handle it when the wrong protocol is acquired? Um, and a lot of this can be minimized by utilizing dedicated imaging professional staff at each site. And this is just an example of a case where we have a beautiful um, MRI MP rage. Um, and unfortunately, another time the patient came in, they chose the wrong protocol in the scanner. And you can see we're not able to do any gray white matter segmentation or analysis on that bad image above. So record keeping and compliance, it's very important um, to understand all of this alphabet soup. This is well beyond the scope of, of what I'm presenting today, but to again, encourage you um, to work with experts in all of these things, particularly if you're using a multi-site study and especially if it's an international study because the rules that are in place at your institution or in your country can be very different than the rules in other countries. Some of our most dramatic examples have come up um, when we're trying to do our multi-site studies with Germany, for example. The um, regulations for the use of radiation in humans are quite different and are calculated differently and the ethics committee process goes by quite differently. And um, this also influences your ligand development needs. So you need to understand if you're using um, established tracers or is this something your the local cyclotrons are gonna be able to produce? Will there be licensing issues? Um, and then really critically, who's responsible for the oversight? So this is a compound that's being oftentimes manufactured on site and injected in human beings. Um, is it the responsibility for that local site oversight? Is it the responsibility of the FDA? If you're in the United States, is it under an IND? And then who, who holds the IND for that site? And I'll just um, show you an example with PibPET. So uh, PibPET is an amyloid imaging tracer and it was developed around 2005 by Bill Clunk and Chet Mathis at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and so initially we were using it under our local radiation guidance, the RDRC networks um, across the United States. So each institution has its own RDRC that's regulating the use of radioactivity there. Um, over time, um, this has changed as we've uh, accumulated more and more scans and participants. Uh, many of our sites have transitioned to being under a local IND submission by one of their investigators. And then when we went to the clinical trial, we realized for the trial integrity as a whole, we needed a single IND to be responsible. But then this actually meant that we were going to need to be able to send people out to physically inspect and certify these cyclotrons. Um, and now it's, it's on us what, if something goes wrong at another site with purity or preparation, et cetera. So really important considerations with ligand development and tracers. This is just to show you though, um, some of the powerful results you can get when you start to do this in a multi-site study. So this autosomal dominant AD is extremely rare. Um, it's about uh, a very, very few percent of the cases of Alzheimer's worldwide. But you can see here we have um, images obtained at time zero, time of dementia. See this difference between the carriers and the non-carriers. This is 10 years and then 20 years before that dementia onset. I'm just going to play this for you as a movie so you can start to see um, how we're able to develop this interpolation of the data and build this completely new understanding of the disease in terms of a timeline of a process. We imagined but didn't really have data for it that you could have such widespread pathology in the brain years before the symptom onset. And now we're coming up to time zero. This is around the time of symptom onset now. Because it's multi-site and multimodal, we're able to add other um, modalities such as glucose metabolism, integrate that with our MRI measures for cortical thickness. We're able to add tau pet measures to start to look at where this involves the timeline. And so um, in summary, although a multi-site study is 
quite complicated, maybe much more than I ever anticipated. Um, with mentorship, institutional support, and collaborations, both across academic and industry sites, um, you can really develop some powerful scientific findings and achieve something bigger. So um, I just want to thank all of my colleagues, um, both in St. Louis at the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, as well as our in national and international collaborators in Diane and in the Diane TU. And I'll be happy to address questions um, either through our session or by email. Thank you.